Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Civilized Pills. I'm your host, Jack. And in today's episode, my guest is a world famous ex- expert card mechanic. He's seen in over 200 countries by over a billion people. He's a world renowned card mechanic whose skills cannot be replicated, according to experts and scientists from Harvard University. He is not one of the best. He is the best card mechanic and card shark in the world. In addition, he has a six-degree karate black belt. He has also designed and created board games and puzzles and produced a best-selling DVD series on advanced card technique that is studied by casinos and card players over the world. Here are some famous quotes about him. He's the greatest card mechanic of all time. Muhammad Ali, one of the finest slide of hand artists who have ever lived. Ben Gillette, he does things with cards that no one else in the world can do. No one. Die Werner. Please welcome legendary Richard Turner. Hello, Richard. How are you? Welcome to the show. Hello, AJ. Thank you so much. What a nice introduction. Yeah, and... You're you're from Georgia. You're Georgian, and I like Georgian food. I had something I don't. I never had it anywhere else. I, uh, it was. I'll tell you. I describe. You can tell me what it was. It was like a biscuit or a roll, and then you bite it. it. Inside is a liquid. And the first time I had one, I took a bite all over my face. They said, "Oh, you have to bite it and hold it up so it drains in your mouth." What was that called? Do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's our, uh, you know, it's our national dish and the pride of Georgians. And this dish called Hinkali. And I want to tell you that you described it perfectly. Uh, for the first time, we are going this mistake. I know. I was, uh, the people with me were laughing at me. <laughs> and I thought, you didn't give me any warning. But it sure was tasty. I said, give me another one. But this time I'm going to eat it properly. <laughs> oh, I'm very glad that you liked our uh, food and our uh, national dish. Uh, so, Richard, uh, firstly, uh, can you explain to our listeners uh, the meaning of card mechanic? That's a good question. The meaning of card mechanic. A mechanic is somebody who can fix something. Like a car mechanic, you know, they fix a car. A card mechanic is somebody who can fix a card game. It's not magic. It's not like a magic tricks, tricks, but it's very magical. It, when people watch it, they go, what just happened? But they're techniques to make sure or to control the outcome of a card game, to make sure that I always win or my friend always wins or uh, my friend always loses, depending on which way you want to have it. But that's what a card mechanic is, somebody who can control the outcome of a card game. Uh, And when and how did you become interested in uh, magic and cards? That's another good question. I started, my interest in cards came from when I was a little kid. We were very poor and we had four games, Monopoly, Chess, Checkers, and a deck of cards. And I was the oldest and I did not like to lose. So I, so I figured out ways to make sure I always won. And it came partly from watching a show called Maverick. It was a cowboy show. And he was a slick gambler. And he always seemed to uh, come out ahead or out hustle uh, the hustler. And so when I would, I would watch him and then I would play cards with my sisters and we would play for M&Ms. That's a little candy. And we had them divide up. The reds were the most valuable and the browns were the least valuable. And I wanted all of their red M&Ms. So I made sure all the red ones. Then after I got the brown, red ones, I got the green ones, the yellow ones, and the, finally the brown ones that gobbled them all up. So basically it started from watching old TV cowboy shows, westerns. Uh, and uh, that inspired you that you know, from age of seven, you already wanted to become a, a car shark. Yes. Yep. And, and, I, and I played cards 
girls ever since then, all through elementary school, all through junior high, all through high school. The first day of high school, my first day of ninth grade, guy next to me, I said, hey, let's play a hand of cards. And I won a quarter from him, 25 cents. And the teacher comes in, and the teacher comes in. So the teacher comes in and takes my cards away and sends me to the back of the class. That was my first day of school in high school. Can you remember the first tricks that you invented to win? Well, my first trick was very simple. If we're playing poker, instead of starting to the person to my left, like you're supposed to do, I'd deal one card to myself and I'd go around the table. And then when I was done, I had one extra card. And one extra card in five card poker, it gives you a 20% advantage. And then I started figuring out other ways to make sure I got one or two extra cards. And then I'd get rid of them when we would draw, when we draw for the new cards. So that was one of the first things that I did. And then I came up with simple ways of overhand stacking the card. You'll kind of milk, you pull cards off the top and bottom. So they go every other card and then you do it again there every fourth card. And little things like that were my first techniques. Your biggest life-changing moment came when you were nine. Uh, can ooh, you tell us the background story? Yes, a big change happened when I was nine, and the same thing happened to my sister. We both caught scarlet fever, and um, that caused the retina, our eyes, to degenerate. The first thing that went was the macula, which is the center of the eye. It just, within a minute, dissolved, almost like a stroke. And the rest, the peripheral vision, went from 20-20, which is normal vision, to 20 over 400, which is twice as low as what's considered legally blind. So I went from being able to paint and draw to having to put my nose right next to things. And to see a card, I had to hold it at the edge of my eye like this. Nothing from the middle, uh, from the center. So I looked off to the side. So, um, yeah, that way I, I, st I started going blind at nine. And then it took a, during my teens and 20s, you know, my vision was like 20 over 400. Then the rest of it dissolved where all my retina disappeared. So now I have no real vision. No, oh, it will be very tough for this age. It was at that time. It was tough for me. Yes, I was. Uh, I was very depressed and felt sorry for myself and upset and did a lot of stupid things. But you were a rebellion, and you did uh, was... many things. Um, yes, uh, and uh, I heard uh, you draw very well for the, your age. Oh yes, I could draw very well. I was an artist at five years old. Uh, my kindergarten teacher saw me do this painting with finger painting. I did a whole underwater scene that was in a National Geographic magazine. And she goes, look what Ricky did. And they were all astonished that this little five-year-old did such an amazing piece of art, created such an amazing piece of art. And then all through first, second, third grade, I was always considered the best artist in the class. And I could see something and draw or paint it. And I could do it with both hands. You know, I could, I, I'd write with one hand one year and I'd write with the other hand the next week. And my teachers would tell me, you're weird. This is not normal. You're a freak. Write with either one hand or the other. But I didn't listen to them. That's why I can do things with both hands. So I didn't listen to them. Great. Uh, please uh, tell us about Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, when I was 11, my fifth grade year, they couldn't accommodate me because I couldn't see to do anything. The only thing I could do was spelling and art. And um, so I was, after having all kinds of tests, I was shipped off, shipped off to a special school where they had what was called a VH room. VH stood for visually handicapped. And back then, I did not like the word handicapped. And the VH room, my visually impaired resource teacher, his name was Mr. Ed Bryant, Mr. Bryant, and he was as wonderful as can be. 
And he had an assistant named Mrs. Smith. And at that time, I thought she was probably maybe 90, 100, 100. 120 years old because she was just this little old wrinkled up lady and she was a volunteer but sweet as all get out and Mr. Bland was an amateur magician and he would do tricks for us at in the VH department and I had a friend named Ruben Corral and he would do things like take a snip piece of rope put it in his mouth and I would hold in one end Ruben would hold the other end and then he would say pull and the rope would be restored and he just it blew our minds then he would have a stack of nickels turn in diamonds dimes real simple stuff by today's standards but at the time it just I thought it was so cool. And I was obsessed with cards. And then I would perform my card magic for his class. And one day, Mrs. Smith asked me, she said, Ricky, why do you like cards so much? I said, because I don't have to see. I can feel what I'm doing. And she performed a kindness that really cemented my life. She found this book at a garage sale called Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnes, which all the magicians around the world know about that book now because it's a classic. And she took parts of it and recorded on this tape recorder. She had this tape recorder that was like half as much as I weighed. I think it, I'm from my point of view back then, it was like this wide and about that big and seven inch reel, seven inch reel. And she, she recorded parts on it. And she said I could take the tape recorder home and use it as long as I wanted. Because she didn't need it anymore. And it was something made in the, in the 1950s. So it was kind of a, an obsolete piece of machinery. But anyway, I took it home. And I would. I, it came with this set of headphones that were hard as steel. And I saw this movie on Disney about this monkey. They took this monkey and they put headphones on the monkey while it slept. And then when and it would listen to something during the night. And then the next morning, say it was brush, get up and brush your teeth. The next morning, the monkey would get up and brush his teeth. And so it kind of you kind of brainwashed the monkey. And so I thought, maybe I'll get, learn all these tricks by listening to it while I sleep. And the problem was those headphones were so hard. I could never fell asleep one time with them. Is this an outstanding story? <laughs> that your school teacher recorded a book yes. for you about how to yeah. cheat with cards. <laughs> It's yeah, that, that's the funny part. She did not have any idea. She was teaching an elementary school kid how to cheat at cards. And I always say, thank you, Mrs. Smith, because <laughs> she set my destiny. You are a uh, karate master with a six-degree karate black belt. Uh, how did it start? And uh, please uh, tell us about some of the training and fights. Uh, yes, I, when I was in an elementary school when I fir first started losing my sight and the other kids would push us around. And like Ruben, my other visually impaired person, and I would be going to class and we carried briefcases back then. And the other kids would come up, hit the latches on the briefcases, and they would fly open all of our homework and fly out all over the ground. And they would stand there and laugh at us going, look at the blind guys trying to find their homework. And that was kind of humiliating. And then uh, another two kids, they basically uh, tried robbing me. They took my money out of my wallet or they took my wallet and they start slapping me with my face going, can you see it? Grab your money blind boy. And, and uh, the, one of the kids pushed me to the ground and kicked me in the ribs and they ran off laughing and saying, thanks for the money for Mr. Magoo. They called me Mr. Magoo back then after a cartoon character who was nearsighted. And that just made me want to beat them up. And my favorite show at that time was a show called The Green Hornet, starring Bruce Lee as Kato. And I thought, one day I'm going to learn karate and, like I said, kick in their faces. So that's where my interest came from, wanting to be able to defend myself. So then I 
A couple years later, what changed my life was I met these people who told me, thanks. You know, we're not here by accident. We're here by design. And I started going to church and that, that changed the direction from feeling sorry for myself to wanting to better myself. And I started in 19, March 5th, 1971. I went and I met my karate instructor, John Murphy, and he was the first a white guy to get a black belt in in Wadokai, uh, which is the, the style of karate I trained, was kind of a cross between karate and jujitsu. And he, I started, in, like, like I said, March 5th, 1975. My first test was, I think, April, April 9th, 1971. And I was pathetic. I was so, I only weighed about 110 pounds and the kids, the kids would push, beat me up. And they, so they, they couldn't, I didn't fight against other adults or teenagers. They were having me fight kids. They were, they were having me fight girls and even an old grandma named Noel beat me up. And that was, you know, as soon as they punched, I had, I didn't know how to defend any, myself and I'd end up on the ground. And so I kept moving on. And I kept training and pushing harder. Then we started doing thousands of sit-ups and push-ups and, and everything I under the sun to make my body stronger and stronger and harder. And, and my second test, I had to fight five men, five different fighters in a row. And Miss Mercy Murphy had the test in a in across the border in Tijuana, which is south of the United States, because there was no rules and he didn't want to deal with lawsuits and stuff so that test it was awful i thought it was going to be like a scale from four to six I, I, on a scale of one to ten it was a 20. it was beyond what i some could even imagine how bad it could be anyway um by the time it was done i'll just say that it, wait, it was 105 degrees humidity factor was in the 90s and the first round with, within a few seconds, bam, 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 three shots right in my, my face. It was bare fisted. And I realized I'm fighting for my life. And then the second round, uh, this guy it was a Bruce Lee technique to step over the heel hook. And I, I'd catch it. I thought, oh man, I blocked it. All I did was that was just to set up and it spin around and nail me in the sword plex with a spinning heel hook the other direction. Third round, I had this guy kept ramming his knee into my gut because I couldn't wait. When I thought I had to Im immediately go in or I just got hit, I was not a counter puncher because I couldn't see well enough to see the punches coming. So I had to, as soon as I said fight, I had to just run in and go. And like I said, that guy kept ramming his knee into my my gut. Fourth round, this guy almost took me out. He dropped his gut, reversed his punch, caught me right in the left eye and everything went black, fell to the floor. Murphy picked me up and said, Wipe off the blood. Keep fighting. Don't think about it. And then the fifth round, I was so dazed, I couldn't even hold my arms up. But they said tiempo, which means time in Spanish. And right that minute is when I dropped to the floor and I just wanted uh, a drink of water. I was so gasping. And I crawled to the bathroom. And when I came to my senses, I was drinking out of a T1 toilet. Pathetic. Anyway, then I didn't really I have to train harder so, because the next time I had to fight 10 men in a row to attend two minute rounds. So I trained really hard. I did put, I did pretty well on that one. The biggest test, the black belt, I had to fight 10 three minute rounds with a fresh black belt each round. And uh, it was June 6th, 1984, exactly 40 years to the day of D-Day in World War II. June 6th, 1944. And it was my D day. And I was at this time I became a celebrity with my cards and stuff. So the media was there. One of our big television network was there. One of the biggest newspapers in the United States, the El Los Angeles Times, were there covering the test. And so if I got knocked out, it was going to be pretty darn pathetic and embarrassing. So I I trained like a mad dog. I'll just give you a quick rundown of my workout. I'd start out with a weight workout, four hours weights. Then I would do 
a hundred kicks on the bag back and forth with different kicks. Then I'd, I'd chase a guy, he'd hold a bag and I'd have to do a hundred kicks in three minutes. And I'd do that 10 times. So that was a thousand kicks. And then I would uh, run five miles. And one of the miles was downhill and back up. And then I'd do 10 quarter mile wind sprints. And then I would throw up. That was my daytime workout. And then I'd go to go and practice fighting at night. So that was my training. Anyway, during that test, uh, real quickly, I, I the first round I did all right because I just took one good shot in the gut and you can see me folding up. Second round, within the first few seconds of the second round, you hear this pop. That was my nose. I caught a jab right on the button and splattered my nose and some other shots. Third round, that was Kim. Kimbo, Kimco, and I did all right with him. Fourth round was Diego Gonzalez, and we were equally matched because we're both same size and pretty much skill. And we're, it looks like we're trying to kill each other, even though we're good friends. But the bottom line is the seventh round, I fought the champion of Mexico. He weighed, outweighed me by about uh, uh, 50 pounds. He, I was 168. He weighed over 205. So he was about 40 pounds heavier than I was. And I caught a ridge hand here. He ruptured my right eardrum. And I always kept my hands in like this. So I didn't have to block shots. I didn't have to see them coming. I just, uh, I would, just, that way they came in, I'd just already be protected. Now protect my cheeks on down and my ribs. Anyway, I caught a kick right there. And it uh, broke me. There's, you know, actually, I don't think you can't, I can't see it, but you can still weren't see what was broken. Broke yes. that arm. It broke that arm. So I fought three and a half rounds with a broken right arm. But I uh, I managed to make it to the end, and uh, I was awarded my my black belt. And then since then, I you know the tests after that were not as initially hard, as hard as the initial one. You know you had to as you went up in the ranks, your job was to teach, learn things, and then teach others, and so on. But I got up to six six degree. I, I will not go any further because my sensei died two years ago, and I'm too old. <laughs> oh, that's a very inspiring story, I think, for everyone. Uh, talking about martial arts, uh, can you tell us about your great friendship and uh, some of the funny stories with Muhammad Ali? Uh, Muhammad Ali, I was in a competition in Las Vegas hosted by Siegfried and Roy. They were a very famous magician yes. team. Yeah. Yes, and I, I'm sure you know who I'm talking He's, about. They're all from German, yes, yes. Yes, and this was the first cash prize for a winner of close-up in gambling and card magic, and um, I entered it, and everybody said, there's no way this Turner can win. He's just a gambler. He does gambling stuff. He's not going to hold up his world-class magicians, and Professor Vernon uh, was there, Di Vernon, and he says, you watch. He's like, you watch, Richard's going to be the winner. He's going to be the winner. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know any of this until he told me uh, later. And uh, so anyway, uh, I, I won, and I actually had all 10s, perfect score on all the cards. And uh, someone said they never give all 10s, but I got all 10s, which was cool. Anyway, so afterwards, this guy named Dennis Mark says, there's a VIP that would like to meet you. And I said, who? He says, just follow me. And I go into this big suite. There was about a half a dozen other people in there. And it was Muhammad Ali. He wanted to meet me because he, he was the champion of the world. And in his words, he wanted to see who was the champion with cards. So he had these guys bring me in and he wanted to We'd sit down and I'd show him stuff and I could make him win over and over and over. And he goes, Richard, how do you do that? I shuffle and I shuffle. And you always make me win or you always take my money. And so he was real thrilled. Then a uh, quick story. We started hanging out together. And we one time we're at a uh we went to a, a play together. And he'd sit into my right. And back then, like I said, I could still see out of the corner of my eye, out of my the edges of the eye, and it was a it was a, a blur. But I'm sure you you've seen a situation where they, someone's the light on their eyes glares off, and it looks like they want to kill you. And I and he's only about two feet away from other than our shoulders. 
and and he's I see this glare, and then as soon as he catches me, look at him, he turns back away. And then a minute later, I'm seeing him glaring at me, and I'm going, I could feel it in him. I'm going, Ali, I thought we're friends. Why do you look like you want to kill me? And then finally, that's a good looking mustache. All that time he admired my mustache. I had this big handlebar yes, mustache. Yes, I, I know. I remember your style. Yeah. Did you hear about that? Yeah. And then, um, so I thought, if that's what he looks like when he's admiring you, what does he look like when he, when he wants to hurt you? But anyway, so another time, another story. Um, oh, he would want to show me his tricks. And he had this uh, wand type thing. And usually... A pairing wand, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. And, so it, and so he has his hand here. Yes, let me see where you get where you see the camera can see. Yes, his hand is here and the wand is below it. Okay. It's like it's floating in the air. And this is where he goes, Richard, look, no strings. But he didn't put his hand between the wand and his hand. He put his hand under the wand. Who's going to have strings under it? It's between <laughs> us. So yes. picture like this. And he put his hand under it instead of between. I thought this so far. I actually have pictures of, of him doing that. And um, and then anyway, so we became friends. And, and then another time, this is a year or two later, I'm in a casino and four big African-American men come up and said, Richard Turner, you're coming with us. And I was a little nervous going, these guys were huge. And I thought, I don't think so. <laughs> and then a pretty Bernie human who was Ziegfried and Roy's manager, he said, Richard, it's okay, it's okay. And so they shoved me out the door, stuffed me in a limousine, zipped away, pulled up behind another casino, and they pushed me into this giant suite where Ollie comes running up. He threw his arms around me in a big bear hug and goes, Richard, let me get done. It's so good to see you again. And he had me snatched off the streets because he heard I could find cards in amazing ways and he wanted me to show it for him. So I can actually say that I've been kidnapped and hugged by the three time boxing heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. It was so much fun and so cool. And he was, you know, you, you see him on TV. He was the nicest guy. He was so nice and so kind. This story is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. And uh, yes, he, he was a, a great uh lover of magic and he did yes. tricks uh, on ed sullivan i i think so i remember from ed sullivan he is doing some tricks magic tricks um, and he would, buy, he would go to a magic store he would buy the trick do it for somebody once and then give it to him <laughs> uh, can you remember remember your first meeting with uh diverna Uh, you want the long story? Uh, okay. I'm listening okay. to Yeah. I, I was uh, training with a guy named Bob Yerkes, Y-E-R-K-E-S. He was the top stuntman in Hollywood. He did his first movie in 1947. It was called um, Somebody Misbehaves with Elizabeth Taylor. I can't remember the name of the movie. But he... Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I was working with Bob Yerkes on a TV show called, well, just change, training people to do stunts. So I get a call from a guy named John Wagner who said, Di Vernon would like to meet you. And I thought, oh boy, I've been waiting for this for years. And, and so the day before I were going to go to the place called the Magic Castle to meet him, John Wagner, J.C. Wagner says, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you have to have a suit to get into the Magic Castle. And I thought, a suit? I don't have a suit. I can't afford a suit. This is 1975. And so I thought, how am I going to get a suit? So I went into the Northridge Shopping Center near Bobby's house, put my cards on a coat rack, and I started thumbing through these coats Found this coat, cheapest one I could find. Sales guy comes up to me and says, cut your high card for that coat. And I thought, this is my lucky day. Yeah, <laughs> Jay, I, yes. Jay for me. I said, okay. He goes, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Anyway, make a long story short. I went over to his counter. I said, 
I'll just add three cards here, two twos and a queen. If you tell me where the queen is, I'll pay double for the goat. And if you, he says, you, really? I said, really? And I said, but if you miss it, you give me the coat for free. He agreed. So I threw the cards. I'm showing him how easy it is to follow. And I said, where is it? And he missed it. I said, Taylor, give me a chance to get the coat back. Coat against a pair of pants. He lost again. I said, okay, coat pants against a shirt and tie. Darn it, he lost again. And of course, you know why he lost. Oh, the magician's That's out there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got it anyway, so I got a coat. The next day I was with John Wagner, went to the Magic Castle. And back then, the, the library to the castle was upstairs in the castle. The Magic Castle is a 27,000 square foot mansion. It's actually bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Because uh, a bunch of it is in, in the ground and into the mountain. It actually goes into the mountain. So anyway... I go into this room and there's two tables in the library. One table was seated, was seated, was Di Vernon, and another table was seated, very famous actor called Tony Giorgio. He played Bruna Tataglia in the Godfather movie. If you ever saw the guy stab a guy's hand to the bar, that scene, the guy stabbing the hand, that was Tony Giorgio. So he was a very famous card, sharp card mechanic. So anyway, uh, I'm scared. I'm 21 years old. I have Really bad techniques by my standards now. And John Wagner says, show Professor your bottoms. So I showed him, he goes, that's fine, that's fine. I don't want to go right. You know, he, he just was trying to blow me off. And, and then Wagner says, well, show me your seconds. So I started doing some seconds. He goes, so if I can say this the way he said it to me. I don't care how you're, what you're doing. I don't, I don't care when you deal like that. When you deal like that, it's suspicious. When you hold a card like that, it's unnatural, Turner. What you say your name was, Turner? Unnatural. You know, I don't care how fine the brief is. When you deal like that, I know you're up to something. And uh, then he grabbed my hand and pinned it to the table and says, now keep going. And I did. You know, that's a little better. And the other guy over there, the actor, Tony Giorgio, goes, we'll get the money. We'll get the money. And then I kept showing different techniques. And every time I do something, Georgie would yell, won't get the money, won't get the money, won't get the money. Then I finally did something that got their attention. I had, I had the, I could roll coins on my hands and I think I still hold the world record. The world record was four coins on one hand. I got up to eight coins going around one hand, building a pyramid as they go. And uh, I, I showed them that. Jordan goes, well, I've never seen that before. And um, anyway, so that uh, is when I first met Giorgio. He and I battled each other for many years and uh, for till 2001. And then for the last 17 years of his life, we were very good friends. But uh, uh, Professor Vernon took a liking to me for some reason. I don't know why. And I was very glad. And um, I would start getting rides up to the Magic Castle and spending time with him. And, and he would see, he would tell me something. And every time he told me, the next time he saw me, I could, I, he saw me, I could do it. And he saw that this kid practiced and he probably, he didn't know at that time, practiced 14 to 18 to 20 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. And I actually sustained that for 50 years. So he would watch this obsessed kid do something. Then he started tricking me. He started tricking me. He would uh, tell me, this is how you do it, Richard. You know, and he'd describe the, the cards. Like he said, you want your fingers on the side of the deck. And most people are holding cards up like this in a deep mechanic grip, as, as did Erd Nays. And that was, he said, that's suspicious. He said, you want to have your hands just relaxing on the side, no tension. So I started doing that. And I, I believe that's the way he did it and the way he could do it. And he'd actually have me feel his hands showing me the position they should be in. But I didn't realize he couldn't do it. And I assumed other people could do it. But then that's how I practiced. And then I would figure out ways of doing it the way he described. And then he would, I'd come back and show him and he'd go, not official. Just Larry Jennings, famous magician at the time. Watch it, watch it. And he would get all excited and what's the rhythm, man? Watch the rhythm. What's the rhythm? And he kept giving me more and more difficult moves to work on. And and um, so that was how I met him. And he was he became just well, actually, he considered me his best friend. I didn't know that till I, I was told that by um, the guy that traveled with Vernon for years. Um, Bill Bowers, and he was like a father, grandfather to me, 
And uh, he was actually my best man when I got married. And uh, my wife, Kim, and I, we threw him his birthday when he was 98 years old, two months before he passed away in um, August. It was August 21st, 1992. But he was an amazing man. And it's hard for me to believe that he's now been gone for over 30 years. And because I always read it the day that he might die, because knowing that when I met him, it was early 80s. And uh, and I always dreaded the day that he was going to die. And he's been gone for 30 plus years. But you know, he, he, he was the most influential magician of the 20th century. What was the most important advice you received from Professor Diverne? Uh, the best advice I received from Professor was what I mentioned when I, how I met him, when I was unnatural in my actions, when I would deal in ways that were suspicious. And no, a regular person would not do the moves in that way. And so that's what I learned, is how to be natural, how to act like you're doing nothing when you're doing something. Because he's, he, he Diver would talk about a magician who make a coin disappear. And what he didn't like was the magicians that would make it disappear. Then they'd do all this hand movement, trying to prove that it's not there. As all they're doing is switching it from the back of the hand to the front of the hand. He didn't like that. He said, if it's gone, if you're telling them, you're telling them it's in this hand, you don't have to prove it. If you have to prove it, then they're going to believe that it wasn't in that hand. So that was one of the things that he taught me was how to be natural, how to be smooth in what I'm doing. And then, of course, um, he tipped off concepts of the gambling moves, which is the most closely guarded information in all of magic, in all of sleight of hand, are the gambling techniques. Because those were not developed for the purposes of magic or entertainment. They were developed for the purposes of taking money at the card table. So they were much harder to execute and much harder you know, to get the person to tip, tell, tell you about them. So um, yeah, that's what I, uh, the thing is. Right, uh, um, it, and, uh, and he tricked you into becoming the best in the future. Yeah, he did trick me into becoming the best. And he said some very nice things about me on different TV shows. And I'm too embarrassed to say it because it, they're really nice. He said, he said, written some very nice things. And uh, I'm very honored. One of the fun, I'll just tell you one that he would say. He says, you know why you're so good, Turner? You know why you're so good? Because Turner rhymes with Vernon. Turner rhymes with Vernon. His real last name was Vernon, David Vernon. And yes, so he goes, Turner he said, we should go on the road together. We'll call it Turner and Turner. And I go, no, we'll call it Turner and Turner. Yes. It's a uh, very fascinating. His beautiful trickery and your obsession with learning and practice. That's a perfect combination, I think. Oh, yes. It's one thing to have a natural gift, um, but it's another thing to use that gift and eat it into the ground. Like I think Thomas Edison, I think he's, he's the one that said, it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. In other words, a lot of And I put in a lot of sweat and a lot of cards. Uh, please uh, share something about uh, Ed Marlowe and some of your stories, Ed Marlowe, Edward Marlowe, yes. And some yeah. of your stories with him. Well, Ed Marlowe was considered the, the hard wizard of the East. In Chicago, he first published his book, first book, I think, in 1938. And the same guy that introduced me to Di Vernon, uh, J.C. Wagner, also introduced me or made the connection for me to meet Ed Marlowe. And it was around 1976. And he agreed to meet with me. And I could do some... I had about a year with uh, Di Vernon at this point. So I got a lot, a little bit better, a little bit better. And, um, but he had picked me up and he was just as nice as a, an old uncle, you know, an old uncle that had big cigars. And Ed Marlowe had told me he didn't start smoking 
pipe till he was 35 years old. He never smoked before. He purposely decided to start smoking. And uh, he would take me to the place of the hangouts where we had uh, Simon Aronson and gosh, I can't remember some of the guys back then. Um, but uh, yeah, I got to meet all, all the Chicago boys and, and we would just sit there uh, and we'd go over ideas and concepts and moves. And I, one of my hops, which is a way of nullifying the cut, you know, Ed showed me a nice uh, technique for that. And uh, so we would just sit there and take talk concepts and moves and go over them. And I'll tell you one story between Ed Morrow and Di Vernon. Um, Ed, Ed had a technique, he called it the Vernon story. And it was how a gambler could uh, deal the bottom with the deck laying in, laying his hands flat. And Ed came up with a method and Ed told me, don't tell anybody. So I had this, I was sworn to secrecy. And then the next week I would be with Di Vernon and I would tell him that Ed had a story he called the Vernon story about a gambler who could deal the cards flat on the hand. And then Vernon showed me the actual method. I did not show Vernon uh, what Ed showed me because I told Ed I would not. But I showed Ver I told Vernon, and so Vernon told showed me how the guy did it. And I have to say, between the two, the method that the gambler used was a lot better than the method Ed came up with. But Ed had, I think he has what four thousand moves that he's published. So he's kind of, he has. So much stuff out there. And uh, anyway, so he was, it was just a real pri privilege to spend. I spent about seven years going back and forth between California and Chicago, spending time with Ed. And, and I, have, I can actually say that I was instrumental in getting Ed to come out because I go, Vernon would give me a message. He would say, tell Ed to come out to the castle. They would love him out here. And so I tried to talk Ed to coming out and he he would turn it down. And then finally, I think it was about 1989 or 1990 that Ed finally came out and and uh, and uh, to the delight of everybody. So uh, seven years with Ed Marlowe and 17 years with Di Vernon. That means you know these secrets which have never been written. Yes, that is true. And, and some of the things that I have, they'll probably, I'll probably die with them. Even though my wife keeps telling me, write them down. I said, if they write them down, somebody may find them. You said, and so I, you know, I have all my stuff is documented. And when I say document, I've performed the effects on different television shows, but I don't show how I did it. I just do it. So, um, that's kind of my way of leaving something for posterity. And I actually got that, the telling, do not tell from a guy named Paul Daniels. He had a TV show in England called The Paul Daniels Show that ran yes, for many I years. Remember, I remember. Yeah, I was on the show twice. And, and he told me, he said, we have five cameras on you. All of these people are professional They've seen all kinds of magic, and he, they have no idea what you're doing. He said, whatever it is you're doing, take it to your grave. So I thought, well, oh, maybe I'll do that. But that was 1995 that he told me that. Gosh, that was getting better. Can you tell our listeners uh, why you made your DVDs, yes. which oh, magicians yes. love so much? Yes. Ah. Um, well, I made them to just to document the moves for all the magician and cardmen out there that want to see the moves executed. My first one that came out was called The Chi. It came out in 1990. It's I think it's, it's, it's most famous uh, DVD. Yeah, no. yeah. I, th I think you're right. And and so uh, it has like 100 different moves on, around 100, showing second deals, bottom deals, middle deals. And, um, and I put it out there, and it shows the move. It shows me doing it, and it will basically show how I'm doing it. And then what gets me is I will have magicians come to me and say, you didn't explain exactly how you did it. I'm, I, told, I would tell them, it's on video. You're watching it. I had to create my brain and you're looking at it and you're complaining. And I thought to myself, 
those that complain about it not being spelled out move by move, moment by moment, are those that don't deserve having it. I hate to put it in those terms, but the people that want to develop it will see it and put in the effort to make it happen. Those that want to be spoon fed, they should look at a different profession. Yeah, so when I first saw this uh, DVD, um, so I, oh, of course, I was practicing the second day, bottom day, and some other other techniques. Uh, I thought it was not bad. And when I watched your DVD, and I suddenly realized that what I was doing was completely wrong. Uh, it's really the hardest thing to do with cards, what you're uh, showing and exposing on this DVD. And here's something that Professor Vernon taught me, and very good to know. He said, who skill can't be exposed? Let me explain what he meant by that. Because uh, when I first started doing my magic, I would do, uh, well, I was in theater. And I was with a theater company for seven years. And we also had a line troupe, and we would start, do a start with a magic show as part of pre-show and at first I was a guy named Armando Lucero that did it then I took over that place and but I got the most attention after the show when I'd show my gambling stuff you know I, I showed the magic everybody saw cups and balls and linking rings and all that that was that did not have the fascination with people as the card magic did and so I asked Vernon one day I said, why can't I do a show where I'm showing the moves being executed? I said, why can a magician do a triple lift and then turn it back over and go, watch, watch these perfect second deals, one, two, and then turn over the third card as if they dealt seconds. It was a stupid trick. All they did was a triple lift and dealt top, top, and then turn over the card pretending they're dealing seconds. And I said, now, if I can do it for real, what's the difference to the audience? A guy that faked it, and they don't know he faked it, versus somebody who did it for real. And Professor Vernon said, you're right. There is no difference. And there's no reason why you can't do it. And then that's when he told me about in the 1940s, he got censored by Sam, Society of American Magicians, because he exposed some gambling work. And his point was... True skill cannot be exposed. In other words, you can show somebody how to juggle seven ice cream cones while you stand in a hat, but to show them it's not exposing anything because it's true skill. It's just pure skill. And you can show them, but go try to do it. You can't stand in a hammock and juggle seven ice cream, ice cream cones. And uh, I want to move uh, on uh, Delt which is award-winning documentary about your life story. Um, how long did it take to film uh, this movie? How long did it take to film Delt? I know all too well, five years. They started, they first came and saw me in the producers in 2012. We started production in 2013 and the movie hit the theaters October of 2017, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five years. And they, they followed me around the world capturing excuse me, capturing almost everything that I did as I went to different countries performing and surfing in Costa Rica and on and on. Anyway, so, but they were an amazing group of guys. They were so talented and they have thousands of hours of footage for what became an hour and a half movie. They have so much good footage that it's sitting there and their director, Luke Corm said, well, one thing, you're going to have your entire life here uh, for posterity for yourself uh, to show all your kids. And I'm just waiting for them to give me that footage so I can show. But like, one of my favorite things was a guy named uh, Throdini, like Houdini, but he called himself Throdini. He holds 38 re world records throwing knives. And I was, we were filming for Delt, and I did not tell my wife that I was going to ask a guy to throw knives at my head. I remember and, this scene. I remember well, the scene when you're throwing the knife. Yes. I didn't even know it made the cut. Good. 
And uh, see, I learned th- I learned things about that movie every now and then. I go, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until someone tells me. But anyway, so what happened was, um, I, I would be like, would you stand if someone's going to shoot a bullet on either side of your ear at a car? Would you let someone do that? And they said, no way. I said, let someone throw knives on either side of your ear. No way. So I didn't tell my wife to I was gone in case I got an eye, a knife in the eye, which, which wouldn't damage anything, but still, it might hurt. Anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, get there, and I asked Philadine, he asked, his name was David. I said, David, do you mind throwing some knives at me for the, for the film? And he goes, you want me to throw them at you? So if I throw them at you, I don't miss. I know, no, I mean on either side of me. I said, so we stapled up two cards on either side of my ear, two aces. Okay. And then I'm just I'm sitting there with my card just waiting for him to get finished stapling them. And then all of a sudden, a few seconds later, three knives right here three knives right there. He did not even warn me that he was getting ready to practice. I could have bent over. I could have done anything like that. And that I, right in the side of my head. But he was so confident with his technique that even if I would have moved, he would have been able to adjust. But anyway, so then um, the director asked my wife, how do you, you know, he was so thrilled that I sat there and did that and my wife tells him don't be impressed he couldn't see the darn knives coming <laughs> uh, nice uh, by the way uh, this documentary is one of the best documentaries I ever seen so dear listeners you definitely should watch this film definitely it's, yeah, and you can find Hulu, I think, and uh, Netflix, some places it was on Netflix for years, and Hulu and yes. Amazon and Google Play, you know, any of those video on demand platforms, you can find it. And uh, yeah, but it was it was a, a real fun movie. In fact, it was uh, the number one movie on iTunes, uh, the number one movie of all time, but number one documentary on it, it was iTunes. So that was pretty cool. I only rem- found that out by reading Variety magazine, very big magazine here. Brett Lane was the writer, and he was he he made that comment within the article that's the number one movie of all times, number one downloaded doc- what, documentary. Yes, it's uh, definitely one of the greatest documentary, I think. Uh, yeah, and it's actually, I'm pleased it's touched people all over the world. And um, and my goal was never to inspire people. My goal was to entertain people. That's all I wanted to do was entertain. And for some reason, people get excited about the backstory of my life. And so um, I actually turned down three other offers to have my life story told because I didn't want to do it. I said, I'm, I'm still alive. You do that for dead people. I'm still kicking. Story's not over with, but I finally uh, I finally said, okay, I'll do it. And, and I had three, people, three different offers at that same time, which was separate from the other offers I had. And I went with the boys from Texas, uh, uh, Luke Corum, who's the son of Danny Corum, a very famous magician, who's back to Ed Marlowe. Danny Corum is the one who filmed Ed Marlowe's videos back in 1980, 81, 82. And he was the father of the director of Del Luke Corum. And then Russell Groves was the producer. And, and then Bradley Jackson was the writer. And anyway, other, um, other we, and we, as we traveled around, I'd have from one to 14 people filming when we were when we were on set they filmed all my card work in what was called red cat red uh red camera 5k which is like many times the resolution of 4k or, or hd or 1080 and um and they have all my stuff i have like 20 hours of footage with red camera they built this uh table out of glass huge tape out of glass and so they have the cameras under the table so you can see what's going on above and below the table and uh and anyway but we have just so much footage and i got off of one tangent with that knife throwing but we have every part of my life they have 
in storage somewhere. <laughs> you saw the part of the film that, that, that made the cut, but... And uh, it, I, I want to say that was a great decision because uh, you are both great ent entertainer and uh, great uh, inspiration for the people all, all around the world. Uh, that's I, I appreciate that, and I thank you for that. And I think all the, thank all my friends out there and all the people. Well, it's not a compliment; it's it's a fact. Yeah. Well, I, I, like I said, my goal was to entertain, and I'm I'm happy that I'm doing. I'm glad I'm uh, people are inspired, and that that's the thing. We all have gifts, and we all have challenges. You know, we all have something that we have to deal with. In fact, I, who was it? I met a guy. Oh, um, oh, you. It's you, AJ. Who heard my, what I said on Penn and Teller, that the greatest disability is uh, procrastination and laziness. Yeah. And uh, I think that's one of the, you know, somebody that just sits around and they don't have any energy, they don't do anything. That's a worse disability. And, and, and something that can I, I'll bring up something else fun that, you know, I'm, I just turned, I hate to admit it, 69 last month. And, um, you know, most people start slowing down at my age. I'm still performing around the world. And, but what's fun is by, we're talking about challenges and stuff. You've got to keep your brain sharp. And I have a tech company. Heck, uh, okay. with uh, my co founders, yes. yes, he created Siri, which is resonant on two billion Apple devices. Then he created the sequel to Siri for all the Android devices, Google, uh, called Bixby. And he was one of the first to, uh, company that came up with machine learning to teach the computer how to teach itself, basically. I think it was Sentium. And he has another. Uh, thing they found it called change.org that has a half a half a billion members and we have a tech company called 52 productions yeah. and what we're doing is we're taking all games and i have a number number of games that i created starting at 11 years old at the school of the visually impaired that one the first one that's coming out we call bad -T 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 betty yes <laughs> your first anyway so we're taking yeah, and we're adding voice into it. In other words, if you can't see, you don't have any hands, you can play. So uh, for me, ever since the, the rest of my vision went south and I can no longer put a card up like this and try to get to figure out what they were, I, I can't play cards anymore. But with Adam's technology, and just so you know, he's called the father of voice AI. He's the one that first created the concept of talking to your devices. And I remember uh, Adam from Fulas also. He did a yes. great, great yes. trick in Fulas. Yes, he did a, a Fulas thing. And he and I both had landed with the Magic Castle this this year. And that was always a dream of his. He has, he has filled the dream of many people. And I was fortunate that I was able to fill a dream for him. And that was get him a uh, run, a uh, working run at the Magic Castle. And the thing is, what he did at the castle, I can't tell you guys, but the effect that he did is not nearly as impressive as how he did it. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just, okay, when Adam's going to see this, I'll just say AI. <laughs> but um, he's such a, a, a fun, 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 fun guy, and he's so brilliant. But anyway, I us other parts of our team, like Charles Park, he uh, was founder of Gaia Interactive, did games that went all over the world, and Monster Galaxy had like 25 million users a day, and Andrew Grishy, my friend from Ukraine, who had his house blown up while in the past year from the war, lost his house, lost his car, but he lives in Las Vegas. Now, anyway, he's an amazing guy. He's a triathlete. And uh, in other words, he, and that's a different type of thing. When I say we all have obstacles and challenges, that's an obstacle and a challenge he has to deal with, not a physical one. You know, in other words, he didn't lose a finger or an arm or a leg, but he lost his house. He lost his, he lost uh, 
a lot of physical things. And that's that's a that's a challenge. And and friends that are that are being attacked. And he spent time with his mother. Um, she he had her come out of Ukraine uh, so he could take her around Europe. And that was just last year. Uh, and then now she's how he worries every day about her, him and his her and his family over there. Um but anyway, I got it. Uh, really terrible things uh, happening yeah. in Ukraine because of Russia. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, so I got off my hands. But bottom line on the thing is um, we're going to be able to play all these games by voice. And so we're going to be able to bring in people that could never play before, can play. And, you know, that made me think, you're Georgian. And one of our the persons invested in our company is somebody everyone out there should know, Zaza Pachulia. Zaza, the basketball player, really? they won two MVP uh, champions, the championships uh, with the Golden State Warriors, I believe it was. And that was, I think, 2017, 2018. Anyway, you, you, many of your listeners should know who Zaza Pachulia is. And yes, he's uh, yes. of course. one of the participants yeah. in our company. We, Georgia, are very proud of Zaza. <laughs> yes, just like uh, we have. You know, people that we're proud of, and and you have uh, people over there that you're proud of, and I'm sure that he's right at the top of the list because he's gone so far and done so much, and not many people can say they were champions. Oh, that's uh, that was a very great news for me. Uh, and uh, uh, when you talked about Adam, I think the fundamentals of magic are very important uh, in every profession. And yeah, that is a good point, uh, AJ, is there are so many people that magic was the beginning of what they did. I'll, I'll use a word, the impetus, the starting point. Adam was a magician as a kid. He wanted to be a magician when he grew up. Instead of becoming a magician, he became a tech magician. He used the same he learned as a kid in magic to design and create Siri and all these other things that have literally changed the world. I'll just, I'm going to get off on a little tangent. We, uh, we have a friend named Dave McFadden. He was a big TV and Hollywood producer. He did a TV series called Home Improvement with Tim Allen and movies like What Women Want, Mel Gibson and others. But we've been friends since the 19, 1970s. And the three of us were together. And I always say, you know, I, they say I inspired the world. David entertained the world, but Adam changed the world. His technology has changed the world. Yes. That's amazing. So it's a blessing for me. Here, that's, so all the magicians out there, look at your circumstances and look at what you have. Don't look at what you don't have. What you don't have, you don't need to know you don't have it. Look at what you have and develop that. And look, at, here I'm just, that came from a, a very poor upbringing to where I've got to meet some of the most amazing people in the world because of what? Deck of cards. Why? Because I did stuff with the cards that no one else could do. But I put in the hours and the time. And so there's so many opportunities out there. I hear your one man play also called dealt uh -huh. it's a gift for magicians around the world with over 500 names listed at the end uh, of the play and with a big thank you uh where and when did you film it well it's filmed in london this year 2013 and uh it, i can't i don't know the place because to me everything looks the same so but it was a very very excited crowd and I know people and magicians came from all over the world when they heard I was going to be there. I was so thrilled and honored. And I actually met a guy from Hungary, from Hungary. His name was also Richard. And he started telling me his story. And we have it all on film. 
um, that he had a disease that caused he, his vision to he caused him to lose his vision. And then he saw me and heard my story and saw Delt and Penn and Teller. And that gave him the encouragement the same way it gave you the encouragement, AJ. And then when he was 22 or 23, they were able to operate on his eyes and he got his vision back. But I just said that as a little side again, a little tangent I get off on, of, of performing and the people coming from all over the world to meet with me. And, and they, when I say all over the world, they literally came from Greece, China, uh, Switzerland, Sweden, uh, and all over the place. And I was so honored and thrilled. And, and afterwards, they wanted pictures. And there was uh, there, there was 500 seats sold. And that was, there was seat, maximum capacity was 400, but they, they 500. And they wanted pictures. And I thought, if these people are going to fly all over the world, I sat there for hours taking pictures and signing autographs. I didn't let a single person go until they got what they wanted. Because, you know, I was so humbled that someone came that far. And uh, anyway, my and my friend, Dave, David Reichel, who created a game called Color Switch, which was the number one app in the world in 2016. And uh, it has like a quarter of a billion downloads, Color Switch. And uh, he follows me around the world and he was filming this line that just went all over around the theater. And he just filmed this as all these people came up, but it was, it was very, very fun. And the producers were uh, some people that, you know, um, uh, Joshua J. Yes, of course. Andrew, yes. Yeah. And some of your, your Georgia magicians should know who they are. And they yes. said, Richard, Richard, will you please do it at our event in tw January of 2014? And I said, I, that, that was my gift to the world. That was my last time. I said, please. I said, oh, you guys are so nice. Okay, so I'm going to be doing it again. But um, yes, it was a, my gift after 50 years in the entertainment business. This last month was actually my 51st year as a professional entertainer. It's 51 years ago that I auditioned and passed my first audition for my first play that I was in. Uh, that was a, a professional uh, production. So you're just going to repeat this performance one more time? Um, well, I did it. I, I do. I do it. I just did it. Uh, uh, most of it for a company, a tech company last week. So I say I'm not doing it, but I do it more for corporate um, big companies because um, they have lots of money. And, uh, mm -hmm. and at my favorite audience, I have to say, are businessmen because what I do appeals to them more than I would say any other demographic because almost all businessmen play cards or yes. play cards or have been to Las Vegas, Monte Carlo or someplace and everybody has this in the back of their mind. Can I be cheated? When I go to a casino, are they cheating me? And the answer is no, they're not. But everybody wonders that. And so all of a sudden they see this guy do all these things and control cards under impossible conditions. And it, so it just has a, a magical effect on people. Uh, and so anyway, so that's uh, my, anyway, the Delta. I'll play was my thank you after 51 years in show business. Um, and I had the privilege of entertaining and meeting some of the most amazing people on the planet. And uh, and like I said, it was my thank you. And it's out there. Anyone, you, know, you have the link. You can share it with anyone for any anyone that wants to sit and watch it. It's there. Can you tell us what D-E-A-L-T stands for? Uh, yeah, and the people that did the film Delt, named the film after my program called Delt, Winning with the Hand You Have Been Delt. And Delt is an acronym. D stands for dreams. You know, it's our dreams that fuel the fire in our belly, give us the desire to go and do it. It's our dreams. E stands for excellence. And what opens doors is becoming an expert achieving a state of excellence. And Di Vernon would tell me that, tell me, he would say, Richard, 
If you can do anything, doesn't matter what it is, if you can do anything better than everyone else in the world, people will try to break down your doors to meet you. Excellence. A stands for analysis. We have to analyze our obstacles. We have to analyze our assets. My first obstacle I had to deal with, so the loss of my sight. And but what happened after that? I developed a very fine touch because the synapses of the brain, uh, the haptic and tactile neural network, part of the brain that relates to touch, it was hungry. And because the visual part of my network, of my brain, my well, the vision went south. So all the input there needed another place to go. So it went to my tactile network. So my uh, obstacle was the loss of my sight. The onset was that my touch became more enhanced. And uh, so that's analyze our obstacles, analyze our assets, take those assets, take them to the nth degree. And L stands for loyalty. We must be loyal to values such as honesty and integrity. And there was times that I was not always honest. Like I said, I like to play cards. And um, and I, in, in for me, playing cards and cheating other people, I felt guilty about it, but it was a challenge. It was like uh, training the martial arts, throwing all these kicks and punches and kicks and never getting in the ring to see if they actually work. So I, I uh, in many games, I would cheat, and then I'd cheat the money, money right back at them. So I'd give it back. So that's when I say loyalty. But on the top there into that, I've had offers to use my skills for million. I've had million dollar offers to play cards against oil men in Saudi Arabia, to uh, officers and gangsters across the country and around the world have propositioned me with all kinds of very interesting propositions, I'll say. So that's honesty and integrity. And our, and our integrity is, you know, doing what is right when no one is looking. You know, it's, it's one thing to say you're honest, but it's another thing to do the right thing when no one is watching you. And T stands for... It's a very uh, Christian concept. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That is a very Christian concept. That is definitely a very Christian concept. And uh, T stands for tenacity. You know, and it's tenacity that breaks down the barriers between us and our dream. In other words, we have a dream to become a basketball player like Zaza and be able to get that ball in that little round hoop over and over and over again. You know, that's a dream. And it's the tenacity of sitting there, throwing ball after ball after ball, Toward that darn hoop that gets you from the beginning place to the end place. And because he had that tenacity, he won a number of championships. And he does and gets to do and see and be and go places that other people don't get to go. But that's, once again, tenacity. Same with Adam. He had the tenacity. He started as a magician. He wanted to figure out how to make it possible for those that in my case, can't see to be able to do things that other people can do. My iPhone, I love it. I love my Siri. I argue with her. I argue with her all the time. Mm -hmm. But I love her. You know, I say, Siri, I didn't ask you that. Siri, don't talk to me. I'm on, I'm talking to AJ on an interview. And I, I This time I turned her off so she wouldn't interrupt because she always interrupts when I'm in a meeting, in a meeting or show. So, but anyway, that was his tenacity to figure out and then to come to com completion. So again, that, that was just two examples based on what we were talking about within our, our, our interview here. And, and the same thing with Di Vernon. He read Erdnays. He told his dad, he heard about the, well, his dad actually told him about a magic book. He called it a magic book that was coming out called Expert at the Card Table. And Vernon said, I want it. Dad, I want it. He said, no, you can't have it. This is, Vernon was only like seven or eight years old at the time. Eight years old. Uh, yeah, he was about eight years old. And he said, no, you can't have it because it's about cheating and stuff like that. And so Vernon went out and got it. And by the time he was, by the time he was a 12, 13 years old, he could do many of those moves in that book. But it's only because he put in the hours. And then he kept putting the hours to where he was called the king of cards. So once again, that was just another example of tenacity. He wanted 
to do it. He found it, got the information, put in the hours, and he reached his dream. Oh, what a great concept. And thank you for this also. Uh, many magicians uh, know that you are a touch uh, analyst for the most recognized card maker in the world, uh, the USA Playing Card Company. Uh, please uh, tell us about their cards, which is are tested and approved by you, and the gold silver <laughs> bicycle deck. Yeah, bicycle is the most recognized label in the world. Everybody go anywhere in the world, they'll know what bicycle is. Bicycle cards, the right. And uh, about thirty years ago, they, yeah. And about 30 years ago, they asked me if I would be their analyst because I was telling them things about their cards that they didn't know. And I helped them make a better card. So, um, and you're right, they are the, by, they make the by far the best card. And it's partly because they're the only card maker that makes their own paper. And uh, so they make their own pulp and they will mix in different elements to give that pulp the resilience that it has, like for that snap, that's what you want in a card. You want a good snap to where it goes back in place. Other cards, you do that and it looks like this. After it starts sagging like that, no, you want it to pop back into place. So that's, um, and, and then the gold standard bicycles, the gold seal bicycles, um, I had, uh, I well, the research and direct, the RD director at U.S. Playing Card you know, said, uh, I, I asked him, I wanted to make uh, a run uh, using casino stock uh, for the magicians because the magicians kept asking me, Richard, will you make the bicycle rider back the same way that you made the gold standard B cards, this deck? And I said, sure. So we put all the uh, ingredients together, uh, put it in the formula of making a cake, put all the ingredients together and and the magicians around the world like the gold standard bicycles. And again, like I said, bicycles, the bicycle and me are the best made cards you'll find anywhere. And bicycle, US Bank Card Company is now owned by Card and Mate. And they've been making cards a hundred years longer than bicycle. They started making cards in the eight, 1760s. Bicycles started making cards in the 1860s. But they are uh, now one company has everything. And I actually watched a bicycle slowly buy up all the card companies in the United States. And I remember the last one to go was some card company, I think it was in M Minnesota. And then they pretty much had everything. And now, uh, now everything's under the umbrella of uh, Card of Monday. So, but anyway, but it's uh, uh, it's fun, and and I do it partly for myself because I want good cards, and for the magicians out there, you guys want good cards, so I help make good cards for all of us. It's uh, well known that you practice ten to sixteen hours a day, and have for over uh, fifty years. Um, can you explain the power of practice? and uh, discipline? The power of practice. Well, that's, like I said, you you can have a gift, a gift that's not used. No good. You have to practice. You have to take that gift. If you're a violinist, let's say, and you have a natural ear and a natural touch for those strings, and if you don't take it and put it to its purpose over and over and over, you just wasted a talent that was given you and you did not use it or exploit it or take it to its the degree that it was able to be taken to. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so that, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, I have, would have Vern would tell me something and I just, well, I, I have a hyper, 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 hyper personality in an energy level. My dad was the same way. My sister's the same way. So and, it's, uh, it's so we, genetic, some kind. Genetic. Yeah, it's part. Of it. Yeah, we just we cannot sit still. 
And so I was able to take and just put in hour after hour after hour. And I would analyze what I'm doing. It doesn't do any good just to practice. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. You can practice something wrong. And when you're done, it's perfectly wrong. I see it all the time. I see someone deal a second. Earlier, you mentioned that you did a second deal. And then when you saw that videos, you realized I'm not doing it right. So it was practice perfectly wrong. It'd be like Kaza throwing a ball at the hoop uh, with his with the ball outside of his hands or something. It's a silly that's an example, but it's perfectly wrong. So you have to analyze what you're doing and figure out what would be perfectly right. And uh, finally, uh, Richard, what advice would you give to magicians, our listeners? and uh, people from other professions in order to deal with any challenges while improving and mastering their own work? Well, what I say, what I tell people is look at everything as an adventure. In other words, who wants to read a book or watch a movie where it's only good, 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 good? That's not life. You have ups, you have downs. You have ups, you have downs. You have bumps in the road. But the thing is, how you look at those bumps, those challenges, if you look at them as a, oh, why me? Why does everything bad happen to me? If you look at it like that, you're going to be defeated. You look at it like, oh, here's another challenge. Let's see how I can work around this, work over it, work through it, make it something that makes me stronger. In other words, you're, you're lifting a weight. You're, you're, you're that, that weight is heavy. Okay, you're not going to get strong enough to lift it by looking at it or by crying about it. You look at it as a, a, a challenge, as an adventure. And of course, the weightlifting is probably not the best example, but uh, whatever the situation is, we all have situations. We were talking about the conflict in uh, Ukraine. Those poor people over there, they have to look at things much harder than we do over here in the United States. But it's not, if you cry over it, if you look at it like, woe me, you're not going to make it. You got to look at it like, okay, we're going to see this through. It's an adventure. Right now, it's the part of the adventure I don't want to do. It's like the Bible says, walk, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, nobody wants to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but it also says, I will fear no evil. So then you just take your attitude and you change it to, okay, yes, this is a hard time. Now I'm going to walk through this valley and I'm going to come out on the other side. So whatever that bump is in the road, that challenge, that dip, you Look at it. You look at the mountain in front of you and see the top and go, that's where I'm at. You see that basket hoop up there. I'm going to hit it. I, I see that. I'm going to make it happen. Yes. It's like hero of journey. Yeah. yeah. Yes. AJ, before you go, should we show your Georgian magicians my card room? You want to see it? Oh, of course, yes. of course, okay. yes. You know, it's be weird for everybody. I'm going to pick up my computer, and I'm going to take it. And this is, I'll let you see, this is my office, my messy office right now. Messy yeah, office. Hold it. Okay, that was my computer. Can you see everything? Yes, I see the okay, bell poster. Gonna, and now I'm going to have this Yes. Now I'm going to head to my card room. Okay. And I'm sorry. Okay. I'm opening up my door. This is my personal supply of cards. I'll turn the camera. Can you see them, AJ? Yes, I can see. Yes. Yes. It's a dream of my who loves practice. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's um, how many cards are there? Uh, in here, about 6,000 6, decks, something like that. Yeah, 6,000. But I have about 
six thousand. This is just the stuff in my office. I have about altogether about forty thousand decks left. Yes, are there bees and uh, your your cards. Bees and then and then over here are uh, yes. These are some the of the these are the is that uh, oh here here it is gambler yeah the gambler deck and then I think we have a bull seal. Bicycle, yeah. By, yes, as, is gold that right bicycle, setup? yes, yes. Got gold seal bicycle down here, and uh, and then just other decks of cards. But my and, uh, is it, is it? you're uh, opening it with a knife. With a knife, uh, sometimes yes. What is that? Oh, more more grosses of cards. Who is the door? But you were talking about that picture with Muhammad. Yes. Wow. Now you got on top. Picture was. She went fell. I don't even know what it was. We'll look at that. Worry about that later. And there's the the thing from Muhammad, Muhammad Ali is over here somewhere, and and just other people that I've had the privilege of knowing. Sand masks. All right now. Let me... And delt poster. Oh yeah, there's the delt poster over there somewhere. And yes, then the Siegfried yes. and Roy is over there when I won the Golden Lion. Yes, it, yes, yes, there, there's a Golden Lion. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'll go slowly. And there also your. Uh, My pen and teller up there somewhere. Uh, maybe on, it was on the left this a way? little bit. Yes, here's a full ass. Yeah. And then I've won. Uh, I've won. That, that was. One of the greatest performances in Fulas. Thank you. And then um, also up there is the I, I've twice won the Magician of the Year um, at the Magic Castle Academy of Magical Arts. My wands are up there somewhere too. And yes, other things yes, I don't know what. Yes. And uh, in fact, one of our board games that we're I know with Adam is on, oh. on the table here somewhere. Oh, this is yeah, this is Texas Showdown. One of our games, this is one of the boards. Uh, once again, thank you very much for taking the time for our conversation. I wish you success in your current and future work and personal life. And I wish you all the best with your family. AJ, I wish the same for you and all my Georgian magician friends out there. I'm very honored that you guys wanted to listen to me and and I hope you have fun. I had fun visiting with you. Until we meet. <laughs> thank you. Yes, of course. And thank you very much again. Good. My pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.